My uh, first uh, significant case, I've been doing autopsies uh, since I started uh, my residency in 1957, so that means I've been doing autopsies for 55 years. I've done now myself about 18,000 autopsies, and I have reviewed, signed off, supervised about 38,000 other autopsies. Let's talk about the John F. Kennedy assassination. He was assassinated on November 22, 1963 and the Warren Commission was established. Their report was issued in late September, early October of 64, and published in 26 volumes. I was asked to represent the pathology section, and I said, sure, I would be delighted to do that. I went to the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh, which fortunately is a major library, and already by, uh, I don't know, I don't recall, late October, early November, they had the 26 volumes. To my horror, however, I dis discovered there was no index. So you're given 26 books and go find what you're looking for. I gave my presentation based on what was available to me at that time and everything just mushroomed thereafter. So the next thing that happened of significance was I was contacted by the district attorney of New Orleans, Jim Garrison, who was <clears throat> trying a gentleman named Clay Shaw, who he felt was involved in the JFK assassination and the government was withholding this information. I will tell you right now that what they did was they took all the autopsy materials and they held it for um, <clears throat> two and a half years. Um, we don't know exactly where it was. And then they realized they've got a problem. How do they keep this stuff <clears throat> sequestered forever? and uh, what, who has the legal right, uh, and so on. So they came up uh, with um, a, a document, the likes of which had never been um, executed before and not since. The, they came up with an executive order that all of the autopsy materials belonged to Mrs. Kennedy, everything. Uh, the president's clothing, the rifle, the bullets, the bullet fragments, and indeed even Governor John Conley, who was sitting in front of the president um, and who was wounded, that his clothing and all of the medical records, everything belonged to Mrs. Kennedy. Well, she would have been the last person in the world to have ever even wanted to look at that stuff. This was what we call in law a constructive transfer. She never had physical possession. On paper, uh, uh, she was the owner. And then she then transferred it on paper to the National Archives. And in October 66, a year and a half later, uh, that was inventory. And interestingly, um, well, I'll tell you about that. Some things were missing. But the executive order said that <clears throat> all of those materials could not be examined, could not be seen by anybody for 75 years, with the exception that after, quote, five years, a recognized expert in the field of pathology with a serious historic purpose could apply and could be granted permission to examine them. And finally, I got in and I examined the materials in 1972. And that was a front page New York Times story in which I <clears throat> pointed out that the president's brain was missing and remains missing to this day. The president's brain was there in April of 65 when they logged in everything. And a year and a half later, on October 30th, in 1966, when they did the inventory, the president's brain, microscopic slides, some photographs, and so on, were no longer there, and they've never been accounted for to this day. So in 72, I went in, examined all the materials, and then subsequently testified before the Rockefeller Commission, uh, Vice President Rockefeller in 1974, and then 1977, 1979, I was a member of the Forensic Pathology Panel established by the House Select Committee of Representatives um, to re-examine re <clears throat> the assassinations of President Kennedy and Reverend Martin Luther King. And there were different panels, and I was one of the panelists, and uh, I testified before the United States Congress. And uh, some years later, I was a uh, technical consultant to Oliver Stone for the movie uh, JFK, which was quite an interesting experience, being there with Kevin Costner and Joe Pesci in New Orleans when they were filming that. What happened in the shooting itself, uh, the president was there in Dallas. It was... Um, the prelude to the re-election year of 1964. As they're driving in Dealey Plaza, which is in the center of Dallas, the cars are coming down, 
Actually, it's looking like it's a great day. The weather is improving, the sun is coming out, the crowds are cheering, the flags are flying. Jackie Kennedy is there resplendent in her two-piece pink suit. And in fact, the last words ever spoken to the president from Nellie Connolly, the governor's wife, sitting um, directly in front of Mrs. Kennedy, who was to the left of the president, Governor Connolly in front of him in this open four-door Lincoln. Uh, the last words were from Nellie Connolly, Mr. President, you can't say that the people of Dallas don't love you. And moments later, shots rang out. It was 12.30 Central Time, 1.30 our time. President was struck, his hands come up toward his throat like this, and then Governor Connolly is hit, you see the cheeks expanding, and then that horrible shot, frame 313 of the Zapruder film where the head the president's head explodes and a crimson burst and blood and brain just uh, scatter uh, all over the place. Abraham Zapruder was a clothing merchant, an elderly gentleman, bought an eight, eight millimeter Bellhow camera. As it turned out, fortuitously, Abraham Zapruder got the most important, significant, valid photographic documentation of those six seconds in Dallas. That film was purchased by Life Magazine for a considerable sum. I had the opportunity to study that as a consultant to Life Magazine at their headquarters in 1966. Um, the um, president, going back for a moment, after being shot and Governor Connolly, they were rushed to Parkland Memorial Hospital a short distance away, arriving there at about 12.35 Dallas time and one o'clock he was officially declared dead. The autopsy had been done there by a competent forensic pathologist. We probably would know the answers to many of these things today. We might still be arguing about Oswald, who he was, and whether it was a conspiracy, and so on. But we would at least know where the bullet wounds were, and so on. The body of the president was spirited, was taken out of Dallas illegally. No law existed federally or statewide that permitted that to happen. It would not have been such a tragedy and, and travesty of justice even if, if they had still had the autopsy done that night by competent forensic pathologists, all of whom were waiting around and expecting to be called. <clears throat> because we knew in this case when he died, where he died, and how he died. You know, so ordinarily, you know, these are things we, we don't usually know. In this case, those weren't gonna be a problem. In a gunshot wound case, a delay of eight hours wasn't gonna make any difference either. But to do this autopsy on the President of the United States of America in 1963, dead of multiple gunshot wounds, in order to determine the sequence of the shooting, the trajectory, the angles, the correlation of his wounds with John Conley, who was wounded several times too, they called upon two pathologists from Bethesda Naval Center where the autopsy was done, who had never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. I want you to think about that as American citizens. I don't care you're Democrat, you're Republican, you're young, you're old, you're black, you're white. Uh, makes no difference. Uh, just think, the president of our country, there is no country in the world, not even countries that we, we arrogantly um, look down upon as being uh, not very far advanced, let alone the countries that are sophisticated of Western Europe and elsewhere. There's no country in the world where this would have happened. In the United States of America, this happened. Humes and Boswell, two hospital pathologists, had never done a gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. So if there be amongst you any people who still believe in the Warren Commission, know what you're dealing with to begin with. And that is the problem in the JFK assassination. And here we are almost 49 years later. Again, I don't get into the intric intricacies and subtleties and the machinations of the whole political scene. They're important, they're fascinating, and I, I urge you, I invite you uh, to get into the JFK assassination. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll become enchanted. But we're not talking about that. We're just talking about the basics. Tell me where the wounds are. Tell me what is entrance. Tell me what is exit. Ask uh, the law enforcement people here, Adam Jack, who used to be a homicide. Ask them how important, how basic that is. And then you work from there. We don't have that. Even among the people who defend the Warren Commission, my colleagues, there are arguments among them as to the exact location of these wounds. That's where we stand then. It's absolutely incredible. And of course, the major problem that confronted them was 
tying in all the wounds to one person because now they had a problem. They had arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. They had found this uh, weapon, a Mannaker Carcano. This is a non-automatic bolt action weapon considered by long gun experts, and there may be some in the room here, as one of the most inferior weapons of its kind developed anywhere in the world. So they test fired it, and it was found that it took 2.3 seconds from shot to shot. Got to work the bolt acting mechanism, and without re-aiming, without taking into re-aiming and repositioning at a moving target, remember, the car is moving, right? 2.3 seconds just to physically get off the second shot. Well, okay, now they get Abraham Zapruder's film. They take it frame by frame. The camera was examined by Bell Howe and the FBI, and it was determined that 18.3 frames of that film strip moved through the camera per second. And what they did was they blew them up, and there I was at Life Magazine headquarters doing what the Warren Commission people had done uh, two and a half, three years earlier, looking at blown ups, uh, 11 by 15 pictures in a large room, and then you move in serpentine fashion, like x-ray view boxes, flattened on the surface of these tables, and you studied the shooting, the assassination of John Kennedy at 1 18th second intervals. There's not a word you can utter, a thought you can entertain, a movement you can make 18 times in one second. It's physically impossible, physiologically impossible. You can study this murder. I don't care what homicide detective has been around for a thousand years or what forensic pathologist, nobody, nobody has documented, to my knowledge, a, a film like that in order to study it in that fashion. Well, what did the film show? The film showed that John Connolly was struck 1.5 seconds after Kennedy had been hit the first time. 1.5 seconds. But how can that be? Lee Harvey Oswald had flunked the marksmanship test the first time in the U.S. Marines, got the equivalent of a barely passing score the second time. How in the world could he have done this when it takes the best marksman they could find in the military and the FBI 2.3 seconds? This was one hell of a problem. I wasn't there, but I can imagine sweat must have been pouring from their brow because they've already announced to the world from the first day that Lee Harvey Oswald is the assassin. Lee Harvey Oswald is now dead because on Sunday morning, November 24th, he's been shot and killed by Jack Ruby in the basement of the Texas, uh, uh, of the Dallas uh, Public Safety Building as he's being escorted out and so on. So the case is all over. It's been wrapped up. It's all over, right? Well, now we've got a problem. Well, enter Arlen Specter, a uh, um, recent uh, U.S. Senator of Pennsylvania, at that time junior legal counsel, um, one of the junior legal counsel, and Arlen Specter came up with what is known as the single bullet theory, which I described a long time ago as the magic bullet theory. The single bullet theory holds that one bullet um, went into the president's back, exited from the front of his neck, re-entered Governor Connolly's back, exited from the front of his chest, re-entered the back of Governor Connolly's wrist, exited from the front of his wrist, re-entered the left thigh, and fell out. Well, let me tell you the history of that. On the night of the autopsy, no, let me go back to Parkland Hospital. What did the doctors there see? They saw a big gaping defect on the side of the head, and they saw a, <clears throat> a, a throat wound, and that was all they saw on the president. And I've already told you that the body was then taken away. So what did the doctors see that night? They saw a big gaping defect on the side of the head, and they claimed to have reconstructed a smaller wound, which they said was entrance just behind. And then when they undressed him and took off this corset-like garment that he wore because of a back injury sustained in World War II, they found a bullet hole about six inches below the level of the right shoulder. They probed with their fingers. They probed with instruments, felt nothing took x-rays, saw nothing, opened up the body, took out the lungs, examined the chest cavity, found nothing. Again, I wasn't there, but can you imagine? These guys are doing this autopsy. We came to learn later on there were about three dozen people in that autopsy room, including four-star admirals and generals. Now, you kids, kids, you young folks haven't been in the military. I spent two years. Um, it was a, a peacetime, uh, uh, shared nothing, nothing dramatic. But, you know, you've got to understand military life. Military uh, life, you, you, these are career officers there, and they've got four-star admirals and generals uh, sitting there, and, and they've got a bullet hole in the back, and they don't have a bullet. 
Just, just try to imagine that. Well, just as if it, the bad movie, 130 at night or whenever television stations go off and you look at your watch and you can predict what's going to happen because you only have 10, 15 minutes left so you know what the hell the scenario has got to be. Well, something had to happen. Well, what happened was the FBI sent up information, passed on to them that a maintenance man by the name of Daryl Tomlinson back at Parkland Hospital that afternoon after everybody had left, trying to get to the men's room, found a corridor blocked by stretchers, bent down to move the corridor so he can get to the men's room, and lo and behold, there was a bullet. Nobody had seen this bullet before. There was a bullet. Ah, said the pathologist at Bethesda when they got that information, now we know. When the president lay supine mm, on his back, and the doctors applied pressure to the front of his chest for cardiac massage, that pressure applied anteriorly forced a bullet that they knew had gone in beyond the length of a man's index finger, forced the bullet back out through the same channel, and it fell out, and that was the bullet. Well, ask any, anybody who's ever seen a bullet wound at an autopsy. Tissues become engorged, blood forms. If anything, a missile becomes entrapped. It doesn't move around like a car going through Fort Pitt tunnels. You put it in reverse and it just goes backwards. But that was what they said happened. Well, it wasn't until the next day that they learned what I told you a couple of minutes ago, that there was a bullet hole in the front of the president's neck. Take a look at the person sitting next to you. Do you think if they had a hole in the front of their neck, you'd see it? You think you've got to be a forensic pathologist to recognize a hole in someone's neck? What they were seeing was a tracheostomy. When someone has had a head injury, whether it's a stroke or whether it's a bullet wound or a smash on the head with a hammer and the brain is swollen and bleeding is occurring, you've got to do what the brain does. The brain controls the body. The brain controls the heart and the lungs. So among the things that you do is you make an incision into the windpipe, a tracheostomy. You suction out blood and mucus and carbon dioxide, and you feed in oxygen. And you've got to do that if you want to have any chance at all of saving the person's life. And so they did the trach. And they did the trach over the bullet wound that they did see at Parkland. They didn't do it um, to cover up, I'm not suggesting that, they did, they noted that the bullet just fortuitously had gone through the trachea. So they had, in essence, their tracheostomy already made for them. But the hole in the skin was too small to attach the cuff from the respirator machine. So they had to enlarge it. These two guys doing the autopsy that night, never having done a case, having failed to talk with the doctors at Parkland, which they should have done, never knew, never knew until the next day that they had missed a bullet hole in the president's neck. So now, the next day, they said, ah, the bullet went through and came out, and after traversing the president's neck, striking no bone, saw the starch collar and just fell in the front of his clothing. So as of the next day, Saturday the 23rd of November, the bullet found by the stretcher in Parkland Hospital was now from the front of Kennedy's clothing. Five months later, when the single bullet theory that I told you about was put together, now this bullet had been rejuvenated and had picked up all the strength in the world. The bullet that at the beginning couldn't make it through anywhere, now had the ability to go into the president's back, and by the way, move upward 11 degrees, a shot fired from the sixth floor window coming, hitting the president down there, going up 11 degrees, <laughs> coming out. I'm Kennedy, here's Connolly. If we had time, I always like to get two people on the, on the stage and, and just line it up in chairs and you'd see, but you can, you can visualize this. Connolly sitting directly in front of the president. The bullet is coming now and it's going right from up downward, from right to left and from back to front. Comes out, exits the president's neck, here's Connolly. The bullet in midair stops, comes back about 18 inches, and hits John Connolly behind the right armpit. Not the left armpit, not the left shoulder, behind the right armpit. It goes into his chest, pierces the lung, destroys four inches of the right fifth rib, and Connolly is a big bone, six foot four Texan, destroys four inches of the bone, exits from below the level of the nipple. When you look at the Zapruder film, you'll see John Connolly 
holding a white Stetson hat like this. Here's the hat, right here, at this, at this level. And at that point, he's been shot. And the bullet has emerged below the level of the nipple. The bullet comes out then, and moving downward, it swings upward and comes up and around, and hits in the back of his wrist, produces a comminuted fracture of the radius, one of the two large bones that come from the elbow to the wrist. Comminuted means a fragmented fracture, exits from the front of the right wrist, moves down into a left thigh, and the bullet that Tomlinson, the maintenance man, found at Parkland Hospital under the stretcher in March, April of 64, which on the night of the autopsy was from President's back, which the next day was from the President's neck, five months later is from Conley's left thigh. You with me? I hope it hasn't been too long a day. You have to be mentally agile uh, to keep up with this bullet. So that's the Kennedy assassination. And that is why 75, 80% of the American public continues to reject the Kennedy, the Warren Commission report. Um, and I, I spent all this time because that case, fascinating as it is, important and significant as it is, controversial as it is, is also a magnificent learning experience for you all in forensic science. Because that case depicts more than anything else what can go awry, what can go wrong, deliberately, negligently, incompetently, spuriously, whatever. And we've seen cases like this repeatedly.